Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So let's come to the Father now. Through Jesus, by faith, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Good morning and welcome to Christchurch Sidcup. It's Sunday the 23rd of August and this is our Sunday service. My name's Tom Parsons, I'm the vicar at Christchurch. Later in our service, I'm very excited that Adam, who's just starting his ministry here as curate, he's going to be preaching on uh, the Acts of the Apostles, continuing our series. Now, I'm aware, of course, we're watching in different homes around Sidcup, around the country and amazingly around the world as well. But let's try to be aware of one another as we now sing our first song, which is a summons to one another to rejoice, come people of the risen King. Come people of the risen King who delight to bring him praise. Come all who tune your hearts to sing to the morning star of praise. From the shifting shadows of the earth we will lift our eyes to him. Where steady arms of mercy reach to gather children in. Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice. One heart, one voice, O oh, Church of Christ, rejoice. And those whose joy is morning sun, and those weeping through the night. Come those who tell of battles won, and those struggling in the fight. For his perfect love will never change, and his mercies never cease. But follow us through all our days with a certain hope of peace. Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice. One heart, one voice, O oh, Church of Christ, rejoice. Come young and old from every land, men and women of the faith. Come those with full or empty hands, find the riches of His grace. Over all the earth His people sing, sure to sure they hear them call. The truth of Christ in every age, our God is all in all. Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice, one heart, one voice, O oh, Church of Christ, rejoice. O oh, Church of Christ, rejoice. O oh, Church of Christ, rejoice. Our hearts are prone to wander. Our eyes are prone to wander. Our lives are prone to wander, lost in a fog of our own desires and thoughts and ideas and agendas. The Bible calls all of that sin. And so we come to confess that sin. And of course, out of that attitude flows all sorts of words and actions too that we might call sin individual sins but it all flows deep from within we wander away the prophet isaiah summoned the wandering people of his day back to the lord saying this seek the lord while he may be found call upon him while he is near let the wicked abandon their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts let them turn back to the lord who will have mercy to our god who will richly pardon yes he will 
and he may always be found in Jesus Christ and through faith in Jesus' shed blood because Jesus died to bear our sins away from us, enduring the judgment they deserved, that we may instead be forgiven, justified, rather than condemned. And so, let's say these words on the screen together, bringing our sin to God. He knows them already, of course, but as a way of turning round to him. And so, let's say together, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hi everyone. I don't think you've met my friend Sasha. This is Sasha the monkey. Sasha, you look a bit disappointed. Is everything all right? Um, Sasha said he is feeling a bit sad because his holiday was cancelled and he couldn't go away like he wanted to. Well, Sasha, I bet there's probably people watching who couldn't go away on their summer holidays either this year. Everything's been a bit messed up, hasn't it? Well, I've been reading in the Bible about a man called Paul and he's the same, that he was planning to go somewhere and he couldn't. I suppose that is one good thing about not going away, is at least you don't have to do the packing. Oh, I'd love to see your list. Sasha made a packing list. This is a long list, Sasha. There's the tent and the mallet and the sleeping bag and torch, clothes, swimming things, table and chairs, towels. Wow, Sasha, that is a great relief. At least you didn't have to do all that packing. Well, this man Paul that I was telling you about, he travelled all over the place. He was sharing the good news of Jesus and he would travel from place to place. But then when he tried to go to somewhere called Bithynia, the Lord said, no, I don't want you to go there. And he found he couldn't do it. Mm. Well, you'd think if he had to go to so many places that he'd have a huge packing list. But in fact, there was only one thing on Paul's list. That was Paul's whole packing list. Faith and Jesus was all he took along with him. And he needed it because not only did he sometimes get prevented from going where he wanted to go, also his travels weren't always easy he would go somewhere and find that people didn't want to welcome him and he'd have to leave a town because he was in danger. Sometimes he got persecuted or he got in trouble with the authorities. He ended up in prison. And sometimes he got chased out of town or even injured by people who were very cross with him and didn't want to hear about Jesus. But he always had faith in Jesus on his packing list. And so whatever happened, Paul was okay. So I know you're disappointed and things haven't turned out the way that we wanted them to. But when we have faith in Jesus, we find that he provides for us in different ways. What's that, Sasha? Oh yes. Sasha said that he thinks that in the next couple of weeks, all the children are gonna be starting school again, which I think is true. That's the plan, isn't it? And it must be a little bit un unknown because we don't know exactly what school will be like in the next few weeks and months with different bubbles and um, things you can and can't do. Well, I suppose so. Sasha said, do you think any of the children are a bit worried about it? And maybe you are worried because it's all a bit unknown. But if you are, you can think about Paul and his packing list of just trusting in Jesus and whatever the new things hold, you know that God is with you. 
by his spirit wherever you are at home or at school and you don't need to be worried about the changes so we can remember Paul and that sometimes there's disappointments and sometimes there's even difficult things but in all of it if we have faith in Jesus then he's with us all the time and he'll help us wherever we are that he shared his blood. His return is very close and so you better be believing that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God who reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power and love. Our God is an awesome God. When the sky was starless in the void of the night, our God is an awesome God. He spoke into the darkness and created the light. Our God is an awesome God. Judgment and wrath He poured out of sovereign. Mercy and grace He gave us at the cross. I hope that we have not too quickly forgotten that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God who reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power and Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to meet together each Sunday. Make your presence felt in every service so that everyone, from youngest to oldest, from longest standing member to newest visitor, may be built up in faith. At every service, give your protection and inspiration. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A prayer for our Queen and country. Heavenly Father, we pray for our country, for our Queen and for all those who have been elected to positions of authority at this challenging time. We ask for guidance and good governance in every situation so for them to know what is right and just and for them to act accordingly, even when the decision is not popular. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A prayer for those who are sick. Lord Jesus, in the days of your flesh, the sick were brought to you for healing. We bring to you now those known to us who are ill in body or in mind. May your presence be with them and with those who care for them to relieve suffering and anxiety. For your great love's sake. Amen. A prayer for us all. 
Almighty God, you have made us members of Christ Church in this parish. May we as a congregation reach upwards to you in worship, inwards to one another in understanding and fellowship, and outwards to those to whom we wish to share the good news of the gospel. Make us like a city set on a hill whose light cannot be hidden so that men and women may find Christ as the light of the world and his church as the family of the redeemed and eternal life as the gift of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us now join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The reading today comes from Acts 13, starting to read at verse 4. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They travelled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. The reading continues at verse 49. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region, but the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook their dust off their feet as they warned to them and went to Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. It's important to keep planning, especially when things are uncertain. From September, we'd love to get as many people as possible back into the church on Sunday. And so we're going to be making sure that the plans are all in place for that to happen. And we'll make sure those plans are very widely uh, known and so that everybody knows where they are um, at the beginning of September. Also, something else that I'd like to introduce now is a plan to reach out with the Gospel of Jesus to some of the houses in our area. I've been talking to Simon Knightley. He's an evangelist with London City Mission. And uh, as I talk to him now, you'll get a sense of what we've got up our sleeves. Simon, good to see you. Good to see you, Tom. Uh, let me give you five very, very brief reasons uh, why I think that a local church doing local door-to-door -door evangelism is a great thing to do uh, and a great thing that every church could do. Um, firstly, it's, it's an opportunity to get to know your community. And that may, may sound very obvious, um, but a lot of churches, unless they're actually out in the community in some way reaching out, won't know um, who their neighbours are, won't know who's living um, next door to them, across the road from them, in the local surrounding road. So by, by knocking on people's doors uh, and having a conversation with those people who are in and those people who are willing to chat, it's, it's a great way to actually get to know all the different groups um, within your community. And secondly, it's an opportunity to, to show those neighbours, to show that the members of those community that as a local church, we, we care about them. Um, we're going in love um, with, with the love of Christ as we seek to share the gospel with people. Um, so to stand on, on someone's doorstep, um, you know, to be willing to knock on their door, stepping out of the comfort zone, um, and then listening to them as they start to speak to us is, is a great way for, um, for us as the body of Christ in, a, in the local context to, to show our community we care. And we want to get to know you and we want to hear from you um, as we engage in conversation and seek to share the gospel. So it's to show the community to love and care 
Um, and thirdly, of course, is a chance for evangelistic proclamation. Um, so we will go intentionally, um, prayerfully, aiming to get people into conversation and to start sharing the gospel with them. And, and you know, when I, when I come to, to visit you, we can do some training and I can, I can share with you um, how I go about doing that in my church context and how some of the other missions go about that. Um, another thing I would say, point four, is that through door-to-door ministry, I would say for some people, it could be the only way you're going to reach them. You know, I, I, I meet up regularly, um, and at the moment, just speaking on the phone to an elderly gentleman who's 91 years old, and he's pretty much housebound. You know, so he's not able to get to any church meetings when we're having them in person. Um, and that would be the case for lots of elderly people. And for some people in, um, in, in particular minority ethnic communities, they can be very, very segregated. Um, so actually going to their door um, and engaging them in a conversation may be the only way evangelistically to reach some people. So I think that's another good reason to do it. And the last thing I would say, uh, very importantly, is, it, is it's a chance for discipleship uh, among, among the church. You know, as brothers and sisters, we go together, we go in pairs. And we encourage one another. Um, so for, for that reason as well. Mm. Yeah, and I think, I mean, what because the idea would be that you would come in and do some um, training with us and, um, and actually lead us in doing it. And I think often with evangelism training is you do, you have a, a session on, you know, how to share the gospel. And then you're slightly left hanging, wondering when you're going to get an opportunity to talk about the gospel. But what you're talking about is mm. giving some training, then actually going out and by God's grace, actually doing some evangelism absolutely which is, absolutely. Which is very exciting really yeah. yeah yeah and i remember when i first started doing this in my context and in my church and a couple of people um older folks came on and joined the team and they said oh we're, we're a bit nervous we've never done anything like this before um and they've been coming out faithfully and find that finding that they, they found it a lot less daunting than they thought it would be simon thank you very very much for joining us and um we will look forward to seeing you in a few months time yeah, pleasure, Tom. Really look forward to that. Thank you. All right. See ya. See ya.
and raise a shout of joy for he Hello, my name is uh, Adam Curtis and I'm the new curate here at Christ Church. And um, Tom, in his infinite wisdom, has decided to give me eight chapters to preach for my very first sermon here, which feels like a bit of a marathon, but thankfully the codlings have uh, helped me out and uh, drawn a bit of a map uh, of uh, the Mediterranean to help us on our way. So I hope you're ready, because here the marathon is going to begin with Acts chapter 13. And in 13, we meet Paul and Barnabas, and they are in Antioch, and they are commissioned by the Holy Spirit to go and do the work of the Lord. So off they head to Cyprus. And in Cyprus, we here discover what the work of the Lord is. It's proclaiming the word of the Lord. And some people hear it, and they love it. And some people hear it, and they hate it. And one example of someone who hates it is a sorcerer who tries to stop Paul and Barnabas from preaching. But the Lord Jesus is having none of that. So through Paul, he blinds this sorcerer. And uh, there's this pro council who's sort of like a, a bee's knees in the Roman uh, Empire and a big guy on, uh, on the island. And uh, he sees this sorcerer being blinded. And because he sees this, he believes the word of God which he has heard. So what do Paul and Barnabas do? They're now under the protection of the pro council. Do they stay or do they go? Well, they go. And off they head to another Antioch. And in this Antioch, they go to a synagogue and start proclaiming the word of the Lord. And here we discover what the word of the Lord is. It's a message all about Jesus Christ. And Paul says, everything you heard about Abraham is fulfilled in Jesus. Everything you heard about David is fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus has come. He has died. He has risen from the dead. And now the forgiveness of sins is available to all people, to Jews first, but also to Gentiles. And the Gentiles and the Jews who hear this aren't particularly happy that the Gentiles are included. So they push Paul and Barnabas out. And so Paul and Barnabas head to Iconium. And in Iconium, they go to the synagogue and they preach the word of the Lord boldly. And so boldly that many people uh, come to faith and many people believe. And the Lord Jesus affirms the work of Paul and Barnabas by doing signs and wonders among the Gentiles in that town. Many people believe, but also many people reject. And so they're pushed off again and they head to Lystra. And in uh, Lystra, they proclaim the word of the Lord. But they also see a man who is born uh, lame. And Paul tells the man to stand up. And the man stands up. This great miracle. But... This time, things don't go according to plan because people don't start believing in Jesus. Instead, they see what Paul and Barnabas has done. They think, wow, this is the Greek gods are among us. This is Zeus. This is Hermes. And they start to worship them. And they start to bring uh, animals to offer to them uh, as, as sacrifices. And Paul's like, no, no, we are, we are but men. You've got to stop this. And the crowd don't particularly like this. And they start to stone Paul and Barnabas and drive them out and they're driven out and they head to uh, to Derb and in Derb uh, they go to synagogue and they preach the word of, of the Lord uh, boldly and then from Derb they decide to go back uh, and to encourage the churches which they have um, which have now been established and what does this encouragement look like well it looks like establishing elders it's pretty routine you've got to get yourself leaders you've got to be organized you've got to become a, a group and a body 
and and he warns them actually like this is the road of hardship it's not going to be easy being a christian being a christian is following in jesus's way and jesus uh jesus way took him to the cross and this is going to be our way as well it's a way of hardship and as paul is going around encouraging uh, the churches there is this great disturbance because other people have started preaching that if you want to be saved you've got to be circumcised and you've got to follow the law of moses and all the gentile men in the congregation are like what now we've got to be circumcised and so paul and barnabas they head back to jerusalem to establish that this is true and a great council is formed with those who are preaching that view and the apostles and a verdict is reached that that is not actually the case actually god has chosen the gentiles the good news has gone to the Gentiles. The Holy Spirit has filled the Gentiles. Signs and wonders have been done among the Gentiles. Many Gentiles have come to believe. And actually the inclusion of the Gentiles in God's great family, that has always been God's plan, as has been seen in the prophets, in Amos. And actually, we were never saved by works or by fulfilling the law of Moses. We've only ever been saved by grace. And so... Paul and Barnabas, they take this in a letter and they go to the churches to encourage them with this news that we are saved by grace. However, as they're doing this, Paul and Barnabas, their relationship turns a bit sour and they start to, to fight and have an argument over the trustworthiness of a man called uh, John Mark. And actually it gets so bad that they have to separate and Barnabas takes John Mark and goes this way. And Paul uh, heads to Lystra, takes a guy called Timothy and wants to go to, um, to Asia. This part of Turkey is called Asia back then uh, with the good news. But the Lord stops them going to Asia and actually sends Paul a vision of a man of Macedonia and says, no, go that way instead. And so Paul, being faithful to the vision, heads up to Philippi. And in uh, Philippi, we meet three characters. Firstly, we meet a, a lady called Lydia, who is a dyer of purple cloth. Now, to dye purple cloth isn't a particularly glamorous sort of role because it involves the use of urine. And so she's a pretty like low level sort of worker, but that doesn't bother Paul. And he takes the good news of the gospel and he preaches it to her and her heart opens to the Lord and she believes. We then meet a second character, a slave girl who's filled with a demonic spirit. And Paul drives out this demonic spirit, which is great news for the slave girl, but not such good news for her master. He used to make a lot of money from her. And so he organises this big riot against Paul. And, um, and uh, Paul gets beaten up and he gets thrown into jail. And one, while he's in jail, we meet a third character, the jailer. Original title. <laughs> we meet the jailer. And here, while Paul is in jail, he has this miraculous moment to escape. But actually, he chooses not to take it. And because of this, the jailer is in Paul's debt. You see, if Paul had escaped, then the jailer would have been killed. But because he didn't escape, the jailer gets to live. And so the jailer invites Paul and Barnabas and Timothy sorry, into his home. He hears the good news, he believes, and his whole household is baptised. From Philippi, Paul heads to Thessalonica where he preaches the good news. Some people believe it, and some people hate it and reject it and push him on, and he heads to Berea. In Berea, people with eagerly search the scriptures because they love what Paul is preaching, this word of the Lord, but others hear it, and they hate it, and they reject him, and they push him off, and they send him to Athens. And in Athens, Paul is now in the intellectual heart of the Gentile world. And he goes and he preaches the same message about Jesus Christ. When he preaches to the Jews in the synagogue, he'd started with Abraham and David to get to Jesus. Well, here he preaches and he starts with creation, but he gets to Jesus, to Jesus' death and his resurrection and the need for all people to repent. Then from Athens, he heads to uh, Corinth. And here in Corinth, he receives a vision from the Lord to say, you've got to stay here. I want you to stay and do work here and I'm going to keep you safe. And so Paul stays for a, a long time. And, uh, and there is actually a plot afoot to, to try and kill him and harm him. But actually the plot fails. And actually it is the plotter who ends up uh, dead. Once Paul has been in Corinth doing the work of the Lord for a, a year and a half, he then goes back to, us to encourage uh, the churches. And the camera angle sort of shifts. No longer are we looking at Paul for a few verses. Instead we hear about this couple, whose name I can never pronounce, 
Prosquilla and Aquila, and they are tent makers, sort of everyday sort of people. And we hear about how they evangelize and then disciple this guy called Apollos, who is this great intellect, who goes on to be this great leader of the church. It's a little bit like Homer and Marge Simpson ed- educating some Harvard law professor. But the Lord doesn't care who he uses. He uses everyday people to, to achieve his extraordinary mission. Then the camera goes back to Paul, who has finished his time in, in Corinth, and then he heads to Ephesus. Uh, in Ephesus, he meets some of John the Baptist's uh, old disciples who haven't really heard about Jesus. So he preaches the good news to them. They believe in it. The Holy Spirit comes down. Signs and wonders are done. Uh, people speak in tongues to show that this is the Lord's uh, work and that John the Baptist's disciples have been included. While um, in Ephesus, uh, Paul goes to preach to uh, the synagogue, to the Jews, but they push him out. They didn't really like it. And so he goes to preach to the Gentiles who love it. And in fact, so many Gentiles love it that there starts to be this economic sort of impact because suddenly all these Gentile believers who once would have bought like idols to the great goddess Artemis, they're no longer doing that. And so the silversmiths who used to make those idols, like they're losing out on this money. And so they start this big riot against Paul to try and drive him out. But actually the riot comes to nothing and it's all just gently uh, dispersed. So Paul does God's good work in Ephesus and after he's been there he goes to encourage the uh, churches Um, and while he's encouraging the churches we hear this strange story about him preaching for such a long uh, period of time, maybe his boss gave him eight chapters in Acts, uh, that actually a, um, a man, a boy falls down from the barn where he's preaching and dies and actually Paul then raises him uh, to life. Uh, Paul then raises him to life and uh, continues on his way, encouraging the churches. He then makes it back to Ephesus. He gathers the elders together and he says, actually, the road ahead is not going to be easy. You've got to guard yourself against the wolves because they're going to come for you. And he commits them to the word of the Lord and to the word of God's grace. And then he heads off back to uh, Jerusalem. Wow, what a marathon that was. Eight chapters of Acts. And in all of this, what do we think the Lord God is actually teaching us? What's his big point here? I think his big point is that Jesus is on the move. Jesus is on the move. This little spark which started in Jerusalem with Jesus' resurrection is like this wildfire which is just covering the whole earth. It's it's a little bit like... um, If in Paris, in a lab in Paris, this vaccine for COVID-19 is discovered and then from this lab it spreads to all the hospitals in Paris and from these hospitals it spreads to the whole country and then it starts flying off to Spain and to Italy and to Germany and to Britain and into America and into Russia and into China and into Brazil. It spreads everywhere and everywhere. This vaccine would be on the move and Jesus, he is on the move. He is like a general directing his troops. He's like Wellington over Waterloo, telling Paul where he needs to go, directing his path. He is taking the good news, and this is good news for everyone. Jesus was on the move to all people, whether they're a man or a woman, whether they're old or whether they're young, whether they're single, whether they're a couple, whether they're a Jew or whether they're a Gentile, Jesus is on the move to all people. The Joshua Project estimates that there are 16,300 ethnic people groups. Jesus is on the move to all of them. And as Jesus goes, well, he causes a great disturbance. Some people love him and some people hate him, but this is exactly what he has said has always been. It was always going to be that some would be separated into the goats and some would be sheep, that some would be chaff and some would be wheat. This is what Jesus has always said, that as he goes out, there will be this great division. And as he goes out, it is the same message to Jews and to Gentiles. It is the same message about Jesus Christ. It'd be a little bit like if I'm talking to uh, uh, some Americans and some Brits about the Queen, our good Queen Elizabeth II. If I'm talking to some Americans, I'd probably start a bit more basic, probably show a picture and, and talk about Buckingham Palace. But I'm talking to some Brits, well, they already know those things, so I go a bit deeper, turn into a history. 
But the message is the same. I'm talking about the queen. And Paul, whether he's talking to Jews and he talks about David and Abraham or he's talking to Gentiles and he talks about creation, that which they can see, he's there his starting point. But the message is the same. The death, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and everyone's need to repent and to believe. And as Jesus goes out, he's establishing churches. He's establishing churches with leaders. He's looking for mature believers who can handle hardship, who is getting, who are getting rid of the idols, who are committing themselves to the word of the Lord. Churches are springing up everywhere. And that's how it's always been. The very first church on record in this country uh, was established in the 6th century. Well, now there are 16,000 churches in the Church of England. Like, God has always been establishing churches. This is what Jesus has always been doing because Jesus is on the move. So what is God saying saying to us today here in Sidcup? I'm not done yet. I am not done yet. That Muslim boy in your school at class, that Hindu woman who you work across in the office, that, that daughter who screams and shouts every time you mention church, that, that parent, he just rolls his, eye, his eyes when you talk about Jesus Christ. That, that atheist couple who just glaze over when you mention anything about the gospel. Like, I am not done yet. I am not finished yet. I am on the move. Jesus is on the move. He has always been on the move and it isn't over yet. I remember when I used to live and work up in Edinburgh doing evangelistic works, work with students on campus. And I remember getting to know this, uh, this boy from Hong Kong. And I got to know him in uh, Freshers' Week, the first few weeks of term. And then I didn't see him again for months and months and months. And we were doing this great evangelistic mission week on his campus. And I was out getting some flyers. And then this guy from Hong Kong came over and said, Hi, do you remember me? And if I was honest, I didn't. But we got talking again. And then he came along to a few evangelistic events. And then he came along to a follow-up course. And then he got plugged in at a church. And Jesus became his real living Lord. And I was on the phone to him the other day and he's back in Hong Kong and he's plugged in at a church there and now he's inviting his family and his brother comes along to church with him. Jesus is on the move. I remember at that same mission getting to know this, uh, this girl from France who, um, uh, getting to know this girl from France who when she was a child had, was given a cartoon version of the Bible and she read it and she loved it hearing all about Jesus. But her parents are atheists and they didn't really care, so they didn't take her to church, they didn't answer any of her questions. Then when uh, uh, she got, grew up and she came to Edinburgh and she saw this mission week, she was just so excited to hear more about, about Jesus Christ and she just lapped it up. She was desperate to know more. Jesus is on the move, even if it starts with a little comic book from when someone is a child. So what is, what is God then saying to us today? What is he saying to me? What is he saying to you? What should we be doing because of this? Well, I don't know what God's Spirit is saying to you, but maybe, maybe we just need to get on our knees and just start praying for the people we love and start fasting for them. Maybe we need to start praying that God's good news will spread across Sidcup. Maybe we need to be bold and start telling people, actually, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus, whether they, that be at school or at work. I remember Roger Carswell saying, start use, use celebrations. At a celebration, you always get an opportunity to speak, to, to give a speech at a birthday party or a wedding or whatever. Well, start speaking about Jesus. He's the one we're excited about. He's the one we want to celebrate. Maybe we just need to start sharing this very post, this very sermon on, on YouTube. Maybe we need to start inviting our friends to, uh, to Christianity Explore or to read the Bible with us. Maybe we need to think about financially what, what does our giving look like to support God's mission. Maybe we need to go on God's mission far, far away to a foreign uh, country. Or maybe as you're sat there today, you realise that actually Jesus is on the move and he's on the move to you right now. You know he's the Lord and you need to get on your knees and repent and believe. Or maybe you just need to be encouraged that this is who our God is, that he is on the move that he hasn't stopped, that he isn't finished yet. This is our God. Jesus is on the move and he's not done yet. Let's pray. Dearest God, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, we thank you that you have sent your son, Jesus Christ, that he has come, that he has lived, that he has died, that he has risen again, 
and that through his death and resurrection, the forgiveness of sins is available to all people, to Jews and to Gentiles. We thank you that this news is spreading like a wildfire. We thank you that your son was on the move through Paul and through Barnabas and through Timothy, and he's on the move now. We pray, Father God, may, be, may he be on the move here in Sidcup, and may many people hear, and may many people believe. Amen. Jesus is on the move. Let's pray now as we close our service that we will be on the move with him. Heavenly Father, thank you for this message. Thank you for this great movement of Jesus sent from heaven by the Spirit through his people. And we offer ourselves to be part of that movement today. Show us, lead us, embolden us. We pray for Adam as he settles in as curate at Christ Church. Fill him with a great sense of assurance and that he is in exactly your place for him. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon us and remain with us and those whom we love, both near at hand and far away, this day and always. Amen.